This episode of Snake and Banter was brought to you by Esports Bet, the industry's leading crypto odds matrix. If you've yet to deposit, then if you click the link in the description box below, you can get a 50% deposit bonus on up to 200 USDT. Esports Bet recently released their new hybrid AI compliance system, which opens up every single player to more matches around the world, while also making withdrawals faster, being able to better target the cheaters who ruin markets for everyone. What that basically means is they add a system whereby if people were making too many bets on super low tier matches in a suspicious manner it would flag you and make it more difficult to withdraw to prevent people cheating and being part of betting rings essentially this is a new approach that's going to try and actually target people specifically find them and make it easier for you the legit better to just go out there and bet so if you are already someone who bets in esports or you are interested in it consider esports bet right this is going to be another episode of snake and banter the show with the guy who used to do events and the guy who does events now and the guy who occasionally somehow sneaks into events and then is allowed to play Counter-Strike there. It's Huxy is our guest for this episode, of course, who is technically the in-game leader of Copenhagen Flames, but obviously that's like he is on the team, but no one knows yet, will he play for them in the future? It's a big mystery, or will he go to another team? Spoiler, probably go to another team, but we'll wait and see. No one knows that yet. Technically, nobody knows. Right now, as of today, on Copenhagen Flames. So... Obviously, if people know the way we do the show, Huxley, we always like to start with the guests so you can break the ice a little bit. So we do the good, bad, ugly. People know the premise, the points. So start with good. What is your good point? What are we coming out the gates with here, mate? I'm starting with the good. Um, well, my good thing is that uh, I think that uh, it seems to pay off for teams to actually stick together a little bit more than, than I guess, some years ago. Um, I think the first team that I noticed it with was uh, now Cloud9, that was Gambit before. Right, sure. Um, or Gambit Youngsters even before that. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know that detail though, that's bizarre. Because I know at the time that was the trivia everyone said, but a lot of people now don't know that when they were the Gambit Youngsters squad, that some of those players had played together for quite a while, right? Yeah, they Before uh, they I even used got to, to the play... top, hadn't they been a while together as a core? Yeah, I used to play against them all the time in, uh, in all the HLTV Cups and stuff like that. Um, so to see them grind their way up and... Well, I know for a fact that they used to play like two official best of threes and then they had like four scrims after and... Right. I don't know. They were just grinding <laughs> like motherfuckers, yeah, right? They were just grinding insanely hard, so... Yeah, those guys and then I guess the more uh, recent topic would be Movistar. Um, oh sure for this event yes of course yeah. played against them for a long time as well um they were a team when when we started in flames as well um so yeah definitely i feel like that's a, a good thing especially to set like an example for the lower tier teams uh i don't know if this is the same thing in every scene or only in denmark but at least in denmark <laughs> often people will just have a team and then two months after they will you know kick out the worst oh, player yes. statistically and then you know, that will keep going until somebody gets picked up by a better team and, and that's just how it goes, right? Let me ask you this then, because at the moment, like, you've made the point, but, like, make, give us a reason why then. Give us some reasons why you think, like, sticking together, why, like, why does it pay off? Why, what's, what do you think sticking together brings? Well, I think uh, it allows people, like, uh, who wants to be an ideal to actually develop with a team instead of having to play mixed teams all the time. Um, I think there's some things that you can't learn by playing in... I, I literally feel like it's mixed teams if you switch out a player every like two months or something. Um, so I definitely think that that's good. And then I in general feel like the scene will become stronger as well, just by sticking together a little bit more. Like obviously some people are just better than their team and have to move up a little bit sometimes. But yeah, I think that trend will be beneficial for literally every team, every year scene in the world so yeah it's, it's it's tough to argue against watching uh teams show that longevity really matters i'd say that there's a few examples where mm, like one i think a single player swap can work pretty darn well if there's if there is a very much sure. problem person but uh i think another mm, i don't know i don't know how much of an example like a mouse would be. I feel like they've kind of changed recently. I guess yeah. Well, when, when I look at when I look at Movie Star, I think that right now the eleven months that this roster has been together is are it's been kind of like like they they had these little peaks where at Pro League, for example, they won every match in their group stage, uh, but then they 
had a really rough time where they came in last place at Dallas, last place at Blast Showdown, but suddenly they're just peaking, and I I don't even, I actually don't even know if it's, I guess they know each other very well, but I'm, I'm a little bit kind of like, I'm kind of just still curious as to why they're peaking. Do you do you see anything when you watch Movie Star in particular? I mean, maybe this is a tangent from your actual point that makes you think like, is it their teamwork being that good all of a sudden, or what? What? Yeah, I've, I think it's hard to to explain what's actually what the benefits actually are. Um, I I feel like we kind of felt it ourselves in Flames, uh, mm. even though it was only a little bit more than a year. I still feel like that's a long time in CS <laughs> right now, at least. Um, and I wish we were sticking together as well still, because I, I think we could reach a much higher level than we actually showed, uh, even though that was pretty good for what people expected, right? Um, I think you guys would have done better than Heroic at this event. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I I would at least get more out of Yavi than what Heroic did. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or whatever. Um, but yeah, then Astralis all of a sudden are doing stuff, so who knows? That's All right, let, let me get into this topic then, because here's the thing. This is actually one of my favorite topics, because I actually think I'm sort of in the middle, because here's the problem. On the one hand, I agree with you, right? If you stick together, here's how I would phrase it. If you stick together with, it doesn't have to be the same five-man line. Let's just say the same core of people. So you've got like a similar setup in the team. Maybe you can swap one player or something like that, because most people do one player every now and then, even if it's just like they have a bad attitude or individual slump of form. So if we assume we're talking about keeping the core together, I do agree. If you want to get to like a super high level of like tactical execution, for example, or even just have an insane team player where you just telepathically read each other's minds, it's not really telepathy you just play with them for ages and eventually you just get a sense of what they do and it just makes sense intuitively right i do think that's ideal but the problem is this is the flaw with how we're framing this and modeling it that's when the team's good if the team's bad sticking together forever won't fucking fix anything and definitely if you just keep a team together it won't just it's not like it, you just leave the room for 10 years and come back oh the major winners now like this yeah, the core has to still have like it has to have some qualities to it that are good obviously some good players etc so like the problem with this topic is this. It just will always be a reality that a player change is the fastest way to improve the team because by definition, you can remove players who are having problems and add really good players. But even that obviously is assuming that's a good player addition. So my problem is this. I'll actually use the example of the team you just gave, Hooksy, as to why I think there's there's a point to this, but it depends on the case. So the reason Movistar is a great example is because of the last player to join the team, which is, of course, Sun Pius, the guy who's now getting all the frags and getting all the big games, the AWPA, right? Because if you yeah. remember when he joined that was actually an unpopular move because they kicked smoothie if people remember that story or rather just chose yeah. not to like extend his contract or whatever now if you remember at the time like after watching both of them play i'd say it's almost a push like they're both similarly good orpers actually like i would say smoothie is maybe like flashier the sun pious guy's a bit more like you just hit the boring shots but he does hit them maybe on land the sun pious guy's a little bit better like i say for me it's almost a 50 50 but this is why i'd give this example because everyone remembers back then the stat line used to be smoothie is too good for tater too he would always have like the plus 25 in the series whether they won or lost and everyone's assumption was he's really good and their team's shit well if you actually watch now right if you watch smoothie play at the time you wouldn't remove him for the sun pious guy because you'd be like he's the one player carrying their team whereas actually i think the sun pious guy like i say i don't even know if he's a better opera but he's a better opera for their team their team looks way better when he plays on their squad i've no doubt being spanish like coming from that scene not being smoothie these are all fucking positive qualities here like i say he's almost as good an opera anyway so in my opinion, even if you think Sun Pius is slightly worse or he probably completes their team better than Smoothie did. So that's an example where I think you do have to make a player change sometimes. Because in my opinion, if I had to guess, Smoothie was giving you all the frags you had on the server, but probably nothing else because he doesn't speak Spanish. He's not from their scene. He's a different type of guy and he's not like the greatest team player guy anyway. He's not like a fucking glue guy in your team. So the other thing I would say is this. I do think if you ever look in history... It's actually like an underlying topic. That's why I say it's not necessarily a five-man line. For me, it's like the core. Because if you do look at the cores that stayed together for three or four years, nobody has ever reached the levels of team playing tactics these teams reached. Like the Astralis core. Remember, guys, that core was playing together for like four years before they became the greatest team of all time. Everyone remembers the classic VP lineup. VP stayed together for like five years in a row, guys. Like This is nuts how long. I'd even say, by the way, the modern-day VP, the CIS squad, you think them having the same core for like four or five years didn't help them? 
them make that like super unique playing style that Jim has that he calls around. Like, dude, you can't just plug and play people into a system like that. It's not going to work. Like, you know, you're not going to be able to execute that with brand new players that came in one month earlier who were still learning like the third map in your map pool or something. So I definitely think there's something to this. By the way, as a random aside, Maui State, just because I was watching the game the other day, the Ma Navi versus uh, Movistar game. I would actually say one of the factors, because that's the thing. Movistar is a team where the scoreboard will completely fool you because the scoreboard will look like the Sun Pius guy is doing a smoothie. Like he just carries them every game. But if you ever watch, right, it's not even that crazy an opera, dude. Like if you watch, he just hits all the normal shots. The actual player, I think, has like had an overperformance and looks like he's fucking spiking these guys up. It's that guy, Mopoz. Oh, yeah. Mate, that guy is mental. He's just super aggro on both sides of the map. He's like, he's like yeah. fucking Hampus or Art or something, mate. He just pushes all the time and he'll do like dry entries. Like, dude, I would love to have a player like this on my team because when a player like that hits a bunch of entries, you're going to fucking win a bunch of games. You should never win. Like, he'll just run in dry with like one flash or something. It's fucking mental. So, when a player like that peaks, you can imagine it's going to like just make it one and a half times better as a team. <laughs> yeah, his read, his read. I actually watched some Mopaz demos recently because I did a little segment on him early on in a in a broadcast day, and he's just like his feel for what opens up for him when oh, wild, his team just does other stuff on the other side of the map is very good right now. Uh, yeah, I, I okay. Yes, but, but wouldn't you say that he's more like config actually, and then Alexis maybe more like Hambus? I feel like Alexis is calling a little bit like Hambus, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, he could be. Mopaz sometimes plays extremities, though. So, like, he's kind of like a pressure lurker more than, yeah. like... He's not... Like, Config's kind of like a center pack kind of guy. So, that's, yeah. that's where but, I would But in terms of, like, craziness, especially on the CT side, I feel like he's just... Oh, yeah, on CT, yeah. You know, when, when you see him in the middle of uh, Ancient or something, he's just doing crazy stuff all oh, the time. Oh, I see what you mean, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you meant by um, the Config example, right? Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, you know, the Alex is more like... You know, he's the guy playing yard on nuke on T, right? So he gets mm -hmm. the smokes thrown for him and then he lurks and makes calls from the space he, he's taking and stuff like that, right? So Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, the reason I would say that player is interesting is because it's just not going to show up on the scoreboard as much. It's one where you have to sort of watch to see the impact he's having. Right, let's yeah. move on then. Maui Stick, what is your good point? Yeah, my good's just, I, I think this is pretty shameless North American fandom, but also I think that they're playing very well right now, and that's, that's Liquid with Yakindar. I think this move is one that I everybody was excited about this. It's not like anybody can take the claim that, oh, I knew this was going to work, because I think everybody hoped... It it's was not really a hipster pick, is it? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, so <laughs> it's, it was pretty obvious that it was going to help improve Liquid, but it's just the way that he's integrated and the way that, like, we just had a we just had an ESL like uh, Cologne meeting about storylines and stuff, and we probably talked we talked about Liquid a good amount, and, but like eighty plus percent of our points were about Yukender. Like this, basically, this guy is doing so much in terms of helping them call and play like on on vertigo apparently he's he's doing a lot of help he's just helping them a ton with with like the calling and everything where okay. nitro i'm sure i mean nitro is still the in-game leader but you could expect for certain maps where yukinder wants to call his own plays he's going to be able to do that and deliver pretty well and that's okay. that's showing and i also think that yukinder is uh somehow it's almost like they're working harder because of him uh and i think that the the comparison i made also before was that it feels like liquid is basically on a date with a really hot chick and they haven't dated a hot chick for a really long time like they're basically okay. like okay i gotta step up every every aspect of my life and my game in order to impress her uh in this case obviously it being yakinder and yakinder even said that everybody on the team has 150 hours in the past two weeks which i think oh, is a lie okay. i don't think that's fucking possible like like it doesn't you, seem it, plausible does it like i know people will hit like 120 maybe like if they're insane 130 but hooksy i think 150 seems a little it's a little crazy, right? Is that, Especially that... for all five. Come on, that's the problem. If one or two, yeah. I could believe it. All five? Cool. Yeah, I would believe one or two as well. I feel like I... a guy like Siphon from my team, Yeah, he, he could easily do it because he's just like, you know, he's the guy you, you see videos of on Twitter that he's just playing aimbots after winning an right. insane match or something, right? Like right, literally yeah. five minutes after he's playing CS again. Right. By the way, I will say there's one angle of PR that is so misunderstood because fans haven't figured this out yet. Dude, if I was a pro hooksy, I would just manipulate all you fucks. Like, if I lose a game, I'll just stay for one hour without going with my team and I'll just keep practicing on the PC and, and watching the demo. Watch, I'll, 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 be, I'll make sure HLT so gets all the photos of oh, me would, going like... You would take a flight home. And then home taking notes. Because yeah. right? 
the joke is, like, every fan then will be like, oh, my God, so dedicated, like, oh, I believe yeah. in him. Like, dude, they still say about well, Blame F to this day. Like, they, you'd think they were in his practices. Like, he's the most dedicated the player in the game. Like, how do you know? How the fuck do you guys know? Like, <laughs> it's like yeah, I'm probably up there, but why are we saying he's the best? Like, what? Yeah, there's really I'm, no I'm way of actually doing that as well. But uh, yeah. yeah, it would work. It would work. It would for sure. sure. That's that is one thing in esports where we can't really like real sports. You know, like oh, he got in shape. He looks better. Yes. Like he's been working out. He's yes. been changing his diet. In esports, it's like it's just results oriented. If they're playing well, if all you need to know is this, Mouse Nick. I'm gonna say it. Like a, he's not in the scene anymore. B, he barely speaks English. So don't worry, the scary man can't get us boys. And C, I don't give a flying fuck about this individual anyway. The best example ever is Zeus from Navi. Oh, okay. If people don't know, well, not only was Zeus from Navi by pure sample size of maps played probably the worst professional player in the history of counter-strike individually like remember that stat famously where he dropped the 30 kills against Astralis and then Lopez went and looked it up and he'd played like 1200 maps and that was like his third 30 bomb ever in his like whole CSGO career like bro like that's almost impossible so all I'll say is this Maui Snake he used to have stats before some majors where he was on like the fucking like infinite hours and all you need to know is this if you know Zeus as a person I guarantee he was just idling and he did that yeah. on purpose for exactly that reason so you could never claim by the way it's a genius move if you're not very good individually if your hours are always perfect on steam they can't say you're not practicing i mean as i say you might just be idling or in a demo but it's a great fucking angle to tell you what it's a great like defense against people because the problem is if it goes the other way if the steam hours show 20 hours in two weeks yeah now you better be fucking you better actually be simple in game otherwise you're just done in reputation wise aren't you right i i think uh who, who's well like this probably helped get right a lot too. Uh, how he'd always be like the guy that stays after the game and well past, well past beyond his prime. He, I mean, it's hard to like rip on a guy like get right. Every, I mean, he was such a legend. But well, I uh, actually think he does it though. Yeah, just, just from talking to him a few times, I feel like he's actually a genuine guy. That yeah, would do it. yeah, yeah. But it, in terms of what that did for his PR, it was excellent. In oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but something... I do remember uh, just talking about Zeus when Gambit actually won the major, right? People were talking about all of them having 200 hours past two weeks or something crazy. Like that. There you so, go. I remember like there's some connection with what you're saying. There you go. See, it, I knew yeah, there was something there. No, there were, there were, yeah, the thing with, well, when Gambit won that, they all did, actually. Like, I looked on all their Steam profiles. They all had, like, 110, 120 hours in the past two weeks, and then they won. So, it definitely helps. Like, it's not, there's no, it is a bit of a cheat code to just, like, short-term grind the game like a maniac. So, yeah. Anyway, Hoxie, what do you think about Liquid with Yekinda? Uh, well, I think they look way better than before, and I think it's very obvious that Yekinda is having a lot of impact on, on the whole team. Um... But he is just a very high impact player as well, just individually. He is taking so much space, getting a, a ton of crazy kills that uh, I just remember one specific round yesterday where they were they were getting smoked off like three times and there was no doubt in Fuya's mind like where they were or anything like that. And then he just went in, killed like three guys and they won an unwinnable round. So, you know, that's just chicken that, but uh, and also I feel like he's a, a really good guy, so I think he will fit into a team that talks a lot about uh, getting their mental on point. Uh, I feel like he will help with that as well. Uh, so, yeah, in general, I'm very positive about it. And, uh, well, I hope for Liquid that they can actually keep him. But uh, not sure what will happen, obviously. I actually think this is a really interesting case because obviously, as you just say at the end there, part of the issue is no one really knows. Is this like a short-term thing? Will he just play this event and another event? Will he actually like sign full-term and this is like a real project they're all working towards? So the problem I have is this. Is like I think on the on the most base surface for TL, I think it's a great move. I don't really know if for your Kindar it's that good a move. I'd have to know technically who's available. But like if there really is a availability for some of those big name teams that are failing, like people know like the G2s, the Vitalities of the world, I'd rather go to one of those teams if I'm him, because if you go to the top, you can actually go to the actual top and win the major and all that jazz. So the 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 other reason why for Liquid though, I'm like a tiny bit reserved, is it goes like this. In my opinion, the reason why Stewie 2K 
worked initially so well in that team, but then became probably the main problem in that team, is because that team, the downside they had when they used to have the old tri trio of twists, Elysian Naf, is in general, they were just a little bit more on the passive side as a team. They weren't like, they didn't have like a config or some super aggro player. They just had lots of passive, really good riflers, but passive players. And then think of the other players. Nitro wasn't even like a, a primary opera. And then that, you just got Stewie, that's it. So on that team, basically, I thought like Stewie took his job was just like just create space that's all you do you just run in first die or don't you've got the best rifles in the world following you up if you do it enough you can actually enable the team and you saw the team became a lot more like dynamic after that here's the problem though that can't work forever and i actually thought once it stopped working that was exactly why the team fucking sucked because it was like this guy had to force it every single round like you remember that period like i'd say like a few months after when they were really good where he used to just like he started just like entry oping and stuff on like t side of vertigo and something like what is this and that just shows to me like that's the guy whose job and this is not a job in counter strike by the way his job was like old like 2012 like you're the entry running first like what like that's not my fucking job like that's not a tactic well the joke is if you had to pick anyone to do that in the modern day you can die is that the only player maybe left who does that fucking style so here's the downside and the upside my mistake it's brilliant for team liquor i think it's exactly what they need but the downside is this will he ever hit that wall like that will it ever get frustrating for him that he has to do this because look he's a much better player than stew 2k so i'll say in that sense maybe it won't be as big an issue like just like with stewie when it was working when it's working it's going to be brilliant and you're going to get appreciated the problem is i can tell you in general that is just the career of entry fraggers who have to play hard entry eventually they get it's not even like the team just loses they just get sick of not getting appreciated they get what they feel like is they're just getting told to run into a brick wall 10 out of 10 times and then they get blamed when they the team fails basically so like that sort of role like if basically i've sort of frame it like this if liquid think this is just the move like he comes in and he does what he did in vp and that fix our team i don't think long term it's the right move but i think in the short term it's the obvious right move like they they clearly lacked something in their team he's bringing way more of the shocks did obviously that was a terrible move for both parties don't even know why they ever did that in the first place but whatever <laughs> it is what it is isn't it yeah that move that that didn't make any sense but i think that it this and it feels like this is actually like there was just an interview published right before we started this podcast that basically is about yakinder feeling like he might he's it seems like he's 80 plus percent gonna join liquid now oh, that's maybe cool. not. okay so i think that when this if this finalizes i i mean liquid then to me jump up to a top eight team pretty pretty much instantly yeah and by the way, I definitely don't think it's a coincidence that even though your Kindar stats aren't bonkers, magically Elise is at the top of the scoreboard again. But if people haven't noticed yet, if you just put a team with like a real entry and have Elise coming after him, he will clean up these fucking guys. Man, they one of the best riflers in the world, guys. It's like if you have a player like that, Nico, they are just going to fucking farm if you put them with the right unit. So I th that's why another reason why if you're liquid, you do this, you snap the guy's arm off to get this deal done, mate. You just do it tomorrow if you can. Right, getting just, yeah, briefly, like if we maybe close this topic out after, but basically just watching a liege come in second, like he's he's playing his best event in so long now. And even though he's had to switch some roles, I mean, one of those roles is not having to run in first and that's just better now. So yeah, it's been a, it, like, when you look at the stats, it, like this is the best a liege has played at a big event in, I don't know, year like a year, over yeah, a, it's year. a while. So it's sick. Yeah. Right, for my good point, I've actually picked one that, like, and people might think this is a bit weird, but I think it's really important for the scene. In fact, you'll see this ties into one of my other points later. I've picked for my good point that FaZe has managed to do the course correction, and they actually look like they're back to being potentially the event winner, the best team in the world, like, things work again, their map pool's there, they win the pistols again, the players are back, because if people don't know, not only did they have the drop-off in terms of placing after the major, but people like Rops, their numbers just kept going down and down and down, and suddenly all these, all the qualities you liked about FaZe were gone, because the problem I had with FaZe was this, you'll notice even when they were winning every event, and even when I said they'd win the major, Maui, I never went too far and were like, it's the most dominant team, it's their era, the reason I never did that was, they were always winning close games, guys, they used to just win every 50-50 game pretty much well spoiler if the games really are 50-50 you don't just win them forever eventually it becomes 50-50 you lose a bunch of them so to me I think the last few months they lost a bunch of those games I think certain players just played worse like I think Rops just dropped off after the major okay that can happen but now like the difference is I saw like signs of it in the last couple of tournaments this actually looks like real phase again mate like I actually see I'm seeing the same like win conditions that were making them a great team before and to me the fact that a team picked overpass into them and they won it like like, 
That's that, that's the sign, by the way, when Faze is at peak level, is when you pick Mirage and Overpass into the U. They just beat you on it anyway, even though it's not their map. Like, I think it's actually, they're actually looking really good again. The reason this is so key for me as well, by the way, I've got another point that ties into this. But like right now, when you consider Na'Vi lost a player and are just still figuring out the new lineup and Fears fell off after the major, like we've got no core at the top. Like there's no stability. There's no like this team will always be in the final. This team will always be in the semis. That's actually bad for Counter-Strike, by the way. If you want to follow the game, you might, as much as people might think it's boring when like the favorite wins the game, it provides like a storyline structure for the event when the right teams that are the top teams get to a certain point. Like if you want to eliminate someone like Fears, the best way it happens is like a team that's just below them beats them in like a quarter final then like the story makes sense then we're like right this team's moving up in the world and then they beat them because they're better i think at the moment the last few months after the major it just made counter strike it was almost like it felt like it was online cs again the results just looked totally up and down and aside from navi just having the best player in the world that was it like the, there wasn't any stability so to me i think it's really important that you have a team like phase can actually be like a legit number one team in this case by the way for this tournament it also makes it way better if they win it's another grand slam notch and then suddenly you won away from the win and stuff like these are all like important storyline details we can't just be having it where it's like tournaments happen every week and it's like throw a random set of teams out right that's your top four like that that's not that's not a sport guys yeah yeah i definitely think that it's mostly up to rain to actually make sure that they do well if you look at i'm pretty sure like obviously he on uh overperformed at the beta oh, of uh, course yes the MVP and everything like that uh but uh ov like it's, it's just great for for him and it's like a really impressive that he could actually still reach that level but uh but it was pretty obvious right after that <laughs> there's no consistency to it right now he's back to like doing well again so now face is doing well again i actually feel like the rest of the team uh, obviously, they had a little bit of a dip, but not as much as people kind of make it to. Uh, yes. So, oh, people yeah. definitely overreacted. They made out like the team was just broken. It was never going to be good again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. It's mad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I still feel like they're a really solid team. And like, if, if Rain can just maybe get half of what he was at the major, then they will be a stable top top one team again. So, yeah. Right. I. Yeah, I mean, their real hiccup was at Dallas losing to Cloud9, who ended up winning that event. And the Rubet Cup, I. This kind of, like, FaZe were practicing with a slightly different map pool at Rubet. Uh, I think they were trying to pick. They picked Overpass even once at it, and they were kind of floating it a lot, letting it go to the third map, where. Whereas at the Major, they. I think they only played it once versus NIP. So this was, I mean, like, they're they're kind of, like, trying to build out their pool, or at least it kind of felt like that in the last weeks for, for like, the online play and stuff. And I think right now they're in a position where, I mean, Kerrigan has made it obvious at this point that he cares about Cologne, he cares about Katowice, he cares about uh, the majors. So, like, that that kind of, uh, those, those prestige events are the ones that they definitely ramp up for. So I think... This is a good position for them to be in that they're looking really sharp right now. But I still think, like, actually, I think Navi's... Pro I, it's kind of like them and Navi are basically the S tier of teams for yes. me right now. Sure. It, it, I, I can't really count on anybody else. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the other yeah, yeah. teams with my with my point. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's cool to see. It is cool to see that we basically have these two essentially juggernaut teams that are just going to... like. If all goes accordingly for Cologne, they will meet in the grand finals and it will go the full distance and it'll basically be a major grand finals, but with five maps. So I'm I'm looking forward to all that. Sure. I'm really impressed though by the fact that Kerrigan can actually make it work with an international roster. Even though even though the roster and the players are so insanely good, I still feel like making you know, being the number one to in the world consistently for so long i feel like that's impressive as fuck let me ask you a question on that topic then hooksy because here's the thing partly probably because carrigan just did it but like i noticed fans are trying to do the opposite angle there they're like oh it was overrated how hard it is to have like an international roster or whatever like what yeah, do you think on this topic because no, everyone can't. I talk to, they'd definitely rather play with their countrymen. Like, basically, the, the joke is you only tend to go to these rosters usually if, like, you're from some country that just doesn't have any good players in and you just, you're the one guy that's good or whatever, isn't it? Like, yeah, kind of, you know, like playing soccer and then, you know, you're getting too old and you're going to, to NA to yes, play, right? Exactly. That's kind of the same thing here, yes. right? Yes. Uh, yes. Shout out, Shocks. <laughs> <laughs> keep I'm going, kinda, keep going. I, I'm kind of scared that you know one day that will actually be me and I have to play it it'll be everyone I, eventually don't worry mate it's everyone I, eventually I, 
<laughs> and I would rather stop them uh, doing okay. that or whatever. I might switch to Valorant talent, actually. It just seems a lot easier, honestly. Okay. But cool. Please don't switch to Valorant. Uh, no okay. mind. Um, <laughs> no. But I feel, I feel like it would be so insanely hard. Also because of my playstyle, and I actually feel like Kerrigan's playstyle is somewhat similar to mine. Uh, it's very chaotic and a lot of freedom and... And you know the communication has to be on point for it to work. That's why I feel like it's extra impressive. Like, if it was something like, I don't know, maybe Alexi or, uh, yeah, maybe the the old Astralis actually as well. I feel like that would be easier in that playstyle because they are very structured and and Alexi is very micromanaging. Uh, so for those two styles to work that would be still impressive but not as impressive as as Kerrigan style I feel like that is insane how he's making that work and I, I would not want to try it so yeah sure. I don't know people who are talking that down I feel like maybe try and do something similar and then we can talk indeed right let's move on now now here's the thing I will say I actually told him this before the episode so I'll reiterate for people who don't know Technically, I'm the only one who knows every person's points. Otherwise, each person just knows their own points and we all find out now as they reveal them. So Maui doesn't know what Huxy's points are and vice versa, right? But I actually did even tell Huxy what he has picked as his bad point here because I'm pretty sure he did it intentionally, like tongue-in-cheek, as you're about to see. And if he delivers it correctly, it's actually fucking hilarious. So come on, what is your bad point in Counter-Strike in general at the moment? What would you say, Huxy? Uh... Well, I feel like it's uh, way too easy to actually get to a major nowadays. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You got it. Snake, you got to give it up for that. That's actually yeah, good. Okay. He's actually just said the problem is it's too easy to get to a major now. <laughs> no, but, from, the, uh, from the in-game leader of, of Copenhagen Flames over the last two years. I'm just saying. Just saying. You know, they might they might have fucking, you know, dusted off a few RMRs. That's all I'm saying. They might have Swiss system fees in a few, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so in what sense then? In what yeah. sense? Do you think for obviously, the, the, obviously that's like slightly jokey, but I, by the way, it's, it's a general point though. In what sense though do you think it's too easy? Like, what what should be harder or what makes it too easy? What's what's not good about the format maybe on the scene or something? Well, I, I like in every format and and whatever you do, you can obviously get an easy way. And like uh, the second major we qualified to was, I would say we got pretty lucky, right? Uh, because we were already at the at the RMR, so we had to play like only that to get to the actual major, and we had to play Sprout with a coach as a standard in the first best of one. Then we had to play Sinners, even though they actually ended up doing pretty well and were close to qualifying. I still feel like that's not a team you play against to to go to, go to a major, right? To, if you get what I mean. And then, okay, we had one legit best of three against NIP uh, that was still in like a weird period. I think they just signed uh, Brawlan, right? Yeah, they they are switching out all the time and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So so I get why they maybe were not on top, and that was it. And then we were at the major. And I feel like, well, if I, I if I look back at re like years before that, um, no, actually, obviously now the system is twenty four spots, right? Nobody yeah. has a, a spot for sure, and that's just a lot of spots to give to to everybody to compete for, and. If people remember, like, I'm an old fuck, so obviously I remember, but uh, back in the days, it was like 16 teams, and eight of those spots were already taken from the major yes. before that. So yeah. there were eight spots to play for, now there's 24. And, yeah, I don't know if the quality of, of, of teams you had to beat were better at, at the time as well or something, but I, I just feel like now... Yeah, I don't know. It just feels <laughs> way easier than before. Like the open qualifier was scary as fuck before. Now oh, you sure. can just yeah, yeah. kind of. I, I I don't know if you can breeze through it because I actually haven't been through it for some time now. But uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, there's just so many spots to play for now. So uh, I would like to to see. Well, I, I like the fact that nobody has a spot from the previous major because I feel, felt like that was bullshit because people fell off and rushed the changes and stuff like that. But at least like make it to 16 spots then if you want to like make an open field for everyone to join then yeah that's what i would like to see well i, I do i do like this point in that i i have a hard time really accepting that the top 24 teams should be at a major also because because that whole like ch changing the challengers stage from 
the what major close qualifier, which is what it used to be. I thought that was a move that was in a way it's it's good for the scene and it's good for just giving more teams incentives to be in in counter strike because now those eight teams that were on the fringe of making the major get stickers and everybody knows how much sticker money is important for the survival of a lot of these organizations and kind of contrasting it or comparing it to like for example like a rainbow six or a rocket league scene where they have all these in-game incentive items to be a competitive team so you're gonna you're gonna bolster the the earnings of an org and the players in it with that i i kind of like that side of it i like i like that i think teams should get kickbacks from valve in similar fashion to this actually more often so that there's more uh it long-term and bigger investments in the space but but i think that when i look at the teams it's like for example the teams like <clears throat> eternal fire and ihc and 9z it's like these teams were at the major and it's just it it is kind of a it's just kind of strange because they there seem like you just look at some of those old classic majors like you look at like a cologne 2016 and you look at the top 16 teams and it's like everyone there looked fucking legit everybody everybody kind of like is sort of a historic team in a lot of ways like you don't look at any of those rosters and you're like oh how these guys sneak in but you kind of can now with the majors top 24. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the problem I have is I do think a lot of it, unfortunately, comes down to, like, Swiss system, basically. Because if you notice, I'm not even talking just about major qualifiers. Think of all the Swiss systems you've ever seen in your life in a tournament. Was there ever one where one of the 3-0 teams wasn't like a, who? How are they 3-0? Like, dude, every time, every time. One, every time there'll be, like, a tournament favourite 3-2 just sneak out on the third map of the last one, and there'll be a 3-0 team, like how but then you suddenly you know how because you look at the fucking swiss system and who they played and you were like right so what happened was you had the perfect storm of shit you had two bad teams got drawn against each other initially and then a loser lost and then there was an upset and then two losers and then you, you end up in the scenario where you play a game against someone that should be good and it, it's a bad team right the reason why i bring that up is because swiss system in general seems to throw up these weird like top teams and then secondly this particular major hooksy i thought was the worst because whoever's idea that was to make two different rmrs dude whoever seeded that like listen oh, in yeah. the modern day seeding's usually pretty good that was terrible like again no diss to you, but your RMR was a fucking joke compared to the other one, mate. Like, yep. if you go look at the names, like, dude, their RMR looks like the major. Yours is like, this is to get into the mid. Like, that's because I think of some of the teams that, like, barely made it from the other one. And, like, mate, they must have been looking at yours. I'm surprised more teams didn't complain. Like, I thought there would be a lot more complaining when I saw, like, the two, the difference of the names on the two RMRs. I thought your RMR looked a lot weaker, even if yeah, some of the teams were good, you know. Behind the scenes, there was a lot of complaints. There was, right. Yeah. But yeah, our group was full Disneyland. I don't know what... Uh, yeah, it was wild. What, what happened there, but... Uh, yeah, we, we were obviously just happy, and we, <laughs> what, what is there to say? Like, we, we yes. just beat whoever's in front of us, right? Uh, and I also think as well, this is another flaw. They've done an even stupider thing, in my opinion, with mages. Because they've... I, as bad as one Swiss system can be, they're like stacking the problems of the Swiss system. Because what they do is they have an RMR, but remember, Maui Snake, the RMR isn't you've just qualified, congrats, see you at the major. It's like, oh no, if you went three and zero, you qualified and with this seed yeah. here. So we're now seeding off that dodgy RMR. So we do a dodgy RMR, give us bullshit results, and then we seed off that. And that's how, by the way, at the major, you get results where it's like two nobodies playing the decider match, but then like G2 and Vitality play or something. You're like, what? Like, how? How? And same thing, because you're like, now you're taking the flaws and you're like magnifying them essentially. You're almost like multiplying the flaws. So as much as like, I, look, I will say, I don't necessarily have perfect solutions to this, except for go back to some of the things we did in the past. And the problem I think with this topic as well is this. I don't think the way we did it in the past was the best. Like, like as you were saying there, Huxley, where half the spots came from, like, a legend spot. Well, there were also tons of majors where, you know, a legendary team wasn't actually that good at the next major. Maybe, like, the two best players left or, you know, they fucking just got way worse as a team. So I have to say, sadly, in my opinion, the answer was always obvious. It's just Valve's never going to do this because Valve doesn't acknowledge any seeding that's independent of their major system. Because the problem is, to me, it's obvious. You do it like tennis or something, mate. For the major, you just go and you get, like, take the hitch on TV top, top 10. You don't have to agree with it just generally pretty good take the top 10 teams from hltv top 10 uh, 
two weeks before the major, congrats, you're in the major, or a month before, or whatever. You have to have some time for the RMR, obviously. Say a month before, right? You 10, you get invited. There you go. Now, however many other spots, could be 12, could be 6, could be 8. They're the ones you play for at the qualifier. Like, I'd be fine with something like that. Because the other problem I have with this is the fact that everyone competes for the spots. So, like, to me, it's absurd where you have, like, Na'Vi or Face Clan that, like, beating everyone, winning every tournament. But then they have to go to the RMR, like, Billy No Balls from fucking over here and play the same match. Like, hope I make it. Like, what is this garbage? Like, do you know how bad real sports would be if, like, everyone had to qualify from the same position? Like, Real Madrid just won the championship. They have to start, like, at the bottom of, a, like, an open qualifier and play, like, fucking teams from nowhere in Greece. Like, if people don't know, every now and then those teams would lose and it just ruin the whole tournament for everyone. Like, we're allowing that in CSGO now. Like, we're lucky it's never happened. But I, mark my words, if they keep doing this system, there's going to be a major one day where, like, the number one team just won't even qualify. They'll just yeah. have, like, a one RMR. It'll fuck up or someone will get ill. Think about that. What if you just got COVID or something, like, one day before the RMR? Like, there'll be a, that'll happen one day. And it, sadly, it'll only be when it happens that people react. Because if you notice, people don't actually look at like the way the system works. They just respond to the outcome. So if they if the outcome's big enough, like if Simple doesn't make it, then yeah, then everyone will complain and go, see, oh yeah, I agree, Thorin, now actually RMRs are bad. But the joke is if Simple made it and some bombfuck team didn't make it, they wouldn't care, would they? They'd be like, who cares? If you're good, you make it anyway. Because you, by the way, Mario Stick, you will never escape that logic trap. The logic, the circular logic trap is the favourite of CSGO fans. Which goes like, but it but the winner was the best. Therefore, if you didn't win, you weren't the best. Therefore, there can't be a problem with the system because the winner is the best. It's like you've beat me there, mate. I can't <laughs> skip that. You've you've created a perfectly circular labyrinth of logic. It's not even any way in. So how the fuck can I get out? So, I know, I, you know what I mean? Like, I know, I that's know. nothing. That's nothing yeah. at that point, guys. What, what people don't recognize <laughs> with these kind of systems is that they're just too high variance. That's yes. basically the big problem with them. Like yes. it's it, you, to to seed off of it is so dumb too. I mean, the legend status thing off of the RMR is it is atrocious like i i think i've, I've kind of cha i've kind of moved back and forth on this opinion but I, I basically think that if you made playoffs of the last major the core of your roster should hold a spot to at least get into uh like the legend stage or something like that of okay. the, the next major. yeah yeah that's not bad it, either either top eight or top four I've, I've heard both i've heard arguments for both i've talked to sponge about this a little bit and i think that top four is where it's like okay those are the elite teams and it kind of in a way, ensures roster, a little bit more roster stability too, because like we've seen, we've seen that in the past where other old majors, what you would get if you made it to uh, like top, some, uh, fuck, what was it like? Remember when like Cloud Nine just kept like like some players and they threw on Zelsus or some shit just because they had the roster slot essentially. I don't always love it because it's like that team shouldn't even have like I I forgot how that all broke down, but but like. Was that was that London actually? It was. I, I assume it would be. It'd be after Boston Major when Stewie and Tarek are gone. Yeah, yeah. So at London, it, it, it can be a little bit weird if it's just like three players. But if it's four players plus uh, top four from the last major, I kind of feel like you should you should retain a spot. You notice you've also made another point as well that didn't used to exist because Valve made that stupid rule where you can add someone as the coach but then play them in the game. Yeah. That just allowed teams to like cheat the spot as you're saying. Like because you're right, Cloud9 was the one who did it with the Elsis guy. You're right. They they pretended yeah. he was the coach but. They were just playing him the whole time because they were never going to play like I think it was like Flusher or someone they still had listed that was never going to be the player, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Like I mean, I, I it needs some tinkering with, but I don't think that you should be seeing <coughs> Navi in an o essentially an open qualifier type of format because it also kind of ruins the air of like mystique and prestige and like basically when you give all these younger teams cracks at Navi over and over and over again, eventually they will beat Navi. And yeah, I, exactly. I, I don't think, and I just, you know, that's just like, one day they're going to have an off day and that's just like, it's just, oh, it's just going to suck. Close, like this time or last time or something where with, with the whole thing with the, oh, what, was, what were they called? Like the, the, the guys who everybody thought cheated or something. Uh, oh, Akuma. The yes. Ones oh, the yeah. Yeah. yes. You see, like yeah. stuff like that can happen as well, right? And yeah, yeah. If you can't figure out like what's going on, then obviously <laughs> it's not easy to beat people who cheat in some way. No, if, of if that's what actually happened, right? Right. Uh, yeah. But but I definitely feel like there should be some solution to all of this. Like if it is that the finalists get a legend spot for the next one, and then the top, uh, the semi finalist gets a I don't know maybe the challenger spot, and then the the rest of the, the thing as well get an or something i don't know i also agree with you as well it's not just the system it's the fact that as you say you can also just get lucky like as you say in your rmr you played 
Sprout with, by the way, Sprout isn't even that good anyway, but Sprout with a fucking manager, then you played Sinners, and then you played the BL3 against Nip, but Nip just had a brand new player added. Like, yeah. here's the difference. Right? I always said this back in the day. The reason I used to love when they actually added that first stage, which is now the new, the new Challenger stage, which, as Maui says, used to be just be called the closed land qualifier for the major. The reason I used to think that was brilliant was it removes all those discussions of like, is this region fucking overrated yeah, or whatever? Like, yeah. I always give the example of Sponge's team and the old Brazilians. Like, when they went to that land qualifier in 2015 and they just beat like real teams from Europe, then we had to just all go, fair play, you deserve to be there. So, same thing, right? Obviously, everyone was actually criticizing Copenhagen Flames coming into this major. They were like, wow, they fluked another major. But here's the <laughs> difference if in that RMR, you'd beaten, yeah, Nip, but you'd also beaten like Ents and then say like Astralis. Dude, no one would complain then. Like, at that point, you're just beating the teams. You, you should be in the major if you beat those teams. But the, your problem is it made, it had, that's, in fact, that's the, yeah. the shitty thing. For all we know, maybe your team was in great form and you would have won those games, but we'll never, you'll never get the credit now because you just you yeah. got the easier draw so now everyone will assume it was a fluke right yeah, yeah. actually ruins like, your story as well that, that, that's the most annoying part that I, I feel like, yeah, we, for sure. like I actually felt like we were in pretty good shape and we would sure. do the, the whole thing all over again because I felt like the first run was actually very legit right we even though it was a lot of, lot of business once we still beat a lot of yeah, yeah. teams like G2 Big all those guys before like even in the group right and then this time around it was just like Okay, we have a free zero again after beating Sprout, uh, Sinners, and, and NIP, right? Then we had a two zero change again where we had like Spirit and we fucked that up, right? Okay. And then we had to to play against I think Fallen and the guys to actually qualify for the arena. And I, I don't know, like it, it just didn't feel like, with respect for all the teams that we played against, it just didn't feel like a major run to an arena, right? right. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'll just say, when you say, like, the first major run was legit, like the PGL Stockholm one, the only thing is, though, because technically so many of the good results did take place in that one room where you were all locked in, I just assumed it was, like, one of those Hollywood movies where, like, they do a really elaborate, like, heist and that you guys weren't actually playing and that it was just, like, camera footage of you playing and really it was, like, a really good team was just playing in there and just tearing everyone up online, like, probably Navi or something, right, you know? Yeah. Could it? I could know. be. I can't yeah. technically know that. That, that. Just listen. Anyone could put that footage up in the movie. They'd have that footage looping, and it's, you know, the, the security guard would be like, "Wait a minute, that cat's been passed twice." Like, and that's when he'd go and find the wire cut. You know, like all I'm saying is, be a great movie. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess like the whole hotel room meme that pisses me off so much. Like, oh, of course, yeah, I know. Can we, can we just like can we just get some credit for actually beating these? Guys? Do you know the other thing as well? I'll just tell you straight up. The other real reason I think you don't get credit is because unfortunately, like the guy whose stats were the best at that tournament was Roy, and everyone was like, "But wasn't he like supposed to be the worst player in that bad line team?" <laughs> yeah. So even though like I get like he's a different team, different setup, like that also just didn't that that was like upside down day to everyone because everyone kept seeing he was supposed to like one point one seven rating like. Is that the same guy? Isn't he like 28 years old? Yeah. Who the fuck? Because that, that part just made no sense to anyone's brain, unfortunately. Nah. He was playing great, though, I've got to say. Yeah, Yavi also popped off. I remember, sure. like, the first few games, he was actually insane as well. Uh, so, yeah. Now, on eSports Bet, Obviously, they've got their World's Prediction Series 2 contest going on. 10 million USDT prize pool. First prize, 800,000 USDT. Free to enter on their website. Obviously, they've got loads of CSGO. They've got all these ESEA online competitions, La Liga in Spain. They've got something that looks like, what is it, Saska Ecop? What is that one? I'm going to guess that's some sort of like Balkan Cup or something like that. And obviously, of course, they have got IEM Cologne, which this episode is about the playoffs. Astralis versus Mouse. And we've got Team Liquid versus Movistar Riders. Here's the bet I have got for you guys. Because I am going to say I am pretty confident Team Liquid is going to beat Movistar Riders on stage in terms of better map pool, better raw players, more experience. And they have only a slight favorite, guys, because of how crazy Movistar's run has been. Team Liquid is at 1.853. This is Team Liquid with your kind, I remember. Meanwhile, Movistar is at 1.902. Now, from watching Movistar, the Sun Pius guy is good, but he's not a superstar player. He's just a good opera who hits the normal shots. I don't believe he's going to carry a series against Liquid. The Mopoz guy seems like the big impact player. I think he's actually being a little bit overrated in terms of how he's performing. I don't buy that Movistar's map pool can hold up. Team Liquid is a better squad overall, and even their ups and downs at this tournament, I am confident they will win this one. So, 1.853 odds i'm saying yes please and i'm gonna bet the my max i'm gonna do a 1000 for this on team liquid to win this matchup and remember it's gonna be on stage in the lanxess arena in cologne like i think this is a great match i think you're very rarely ever gonna get a team that is a real favorite with all these intangibles on their side as a favorite like that anyway back to the discussion right know. let's go let's move on to the next topic now maui yeah i've actually realized 
what's hilarious is your your point now for bad is pretty much my point. I think, but we'll see how you make it, and I'll change my life. Go on. Then. What is your bad point? Well, yeah, okay, okay. I'll frame it like this. It's the my my bad is that every team that's basically ranked third through eleventh on HLTV right now is just so flimsy. Uh, yeah, this is my point, basically. Yes. Okay. Okay. There's basically right. no hierarchy. Like, pretty soon we'll tie it to the earlier point. There's Navi and Fears if we're lucky that you can yeah. rely on, and beyond that, there's fucking nothing, isn't it? Like, they can any team could come third or ninth. The same. Yeah. <laughs> every other team, right? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 guess, I guess so. So if I, I'll, I'll make I'll make my point. Maybe I can make it about one team. Then I guess like we could well, then, we could do we could do that. Or I'll do I'll do the pair. I'll do this pair. Like basically, Vitality and G two are just both in very weak states right now. That kind of like rob us of what should be on paper and probably in terms of their investors they, they want these teams to be making it to every playoffs ever and you there's no 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 reliance on these teams. i have no confidence in them ever i, I really like the thing with with g2 i'll start with them is that with, with g2 like i've i've personally just never been convinced that this team is any good structurally speaking uh i think that there's always these times where it's like wow monacy saved their ass in this game or nico carry hard carried all these opening openers or whatever or hunter kind of delivered a subtle 26 frags that kind of just changed the outlook of the entire game but in terms of uh the, the way they play i feel like it's it's very much like up to chance and it's kind of like the basically the biggest problem we've talked about before with g2 for me on their on their t sides is that i think they just use way too much utility early in rounds and then they kind of like float between different parts of the map and it's like sometimes it feels like there there's just wasted efforts and wasted space being taken because then they try to get into a bomb site and they have like one flash or like nothing left and it's like how are you trying to end around like this? It's so it's so crazy to watch them play because and the the all the Alexi B negative comments kind of have actually like those people aren't completely wrong actually anymore. That's the worst part about all this. Uh, all the Alexi way, B I'll, all I'll tell you is this: within G two, they would agree there's a grain of truth. Yeah, there, there's definitely the the Alexi B overrated have, like and just over. They're basically people just think he's not very good. I think those people have kind of been uh, vindicated on on their point. So that's uh, yeah. That, and then vitality. I, it's just like, when is this at roster really ever gonna make it a consistent thing? Like I, 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 I've given the point that you know all of them switching to English for the first time is really. Prob it's kind of like something that should just get better linearly. Uh, so I, I kind of, kind of hold out hope for them. But yeah, my general point was just like you can't really trust even some top five teams, like top six teams, uh, Cloud Nine too. But yeah, what do you think, Oxy, in general, in that sense? Like this, I will say this is more of a topic like from from the analyst side because essentially, if you're an analyst, it it, it kind of sucks when you don't really know like who's going to win the games. Not like in the literal sense. I mean, in the sense of like there's nothing reliable. Like for example, say you go yeah. up there if you were Maui Snake and you'd give like ten minutes of amazing analysis about how like Cloud Nine plays, and then they just shit the bed completely in the game and they don't do any of that yeah. brilliant stuff. Like it, yeah. it just makes it worse for everyone, doesn't it? Like in that sense, you want you need top teams because they have to you have to they're the anchor points for the story for the match for people wanting to watch the game. What do you think of where the scene's at at the moment? Well, because in theory, I, I, it's good for you. It can help you maybe win. <laughs> yeah, beat yeah, these yeah, things you to get to a major yeah. now. You know, oh, oh. Yeah, it ties obviously, in. <laughs> obviously, there's a lot of uh, upset potential. I actually feel like, yeah, I don't know. I'm very surprised about uh, Cloud9 if we can get out of the yeah, 7 2 uh, thing because I feel like Cloud9 was just rock solid in Gamebit, right? For a long yes. period of time, especially online, they were just. Also, when you practiced against them, it, it, it just felt like they never had a day off, and they were always like uh, doing the right stuff and 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 always on the right timing and everything like that. They just never ever made a mistake. It felt like, um, and then all of a sudden now, I feel like I don't know. It's 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 obvious to me that when Nathanie is having a bad day, then uh, that was pretty obvious. Now after Cologne, that then it's really tough for the team, right? Because. Um, He's also kind of that modern IGL that wants to get out there and, and, and take space, right, and make in, entry tracks and, and kind of sets him, himself up a little bit in the start of the round. And if he just, like, he's kind of like Art, but he's holding the walk key all the time, if that makes sense. Like, he's he just want to get in there. Um, talk about Art as well, I actually feel like Furia had, had a really good uh, period where they were pretty stable, but now as well. They, I don't know, they kind of fell off. 
uh, uh, heroic now with the change. They were actually pretty stable. I think I think you you kind of knew what you got from heroic for a long time until they switched up, right? Because they were pretty much top five for a long time. I don't know if you agree or disagree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't yeah, think a guy who agree, disagrees, but um, but yeah, I don't know what's going wrong with like. Obviously, it's two international rosters, the ones you were talking about, right? And I don't have too much to talk about in that because I've always played in a a Danish roster, so I don't really know the the real uh, issues that they have. But I would say I, I kind of thought to myself that the Vitality project would be a tough one to to make work from the start uh, without knowing the players too well, uh, either of them. Uh, yeah, G2, I, I just think that's the general, that's too much star potential, right? And too little go and do your thing <laughs> to help your team uh, from Alexi and Jax. So, and, and also, I don't I don't feel like Alexi is the right ideal for that team. Um, obviously, he, he could change, but like, as I said earlier, he's kind of that micromanaging kind of guy and you don't micromanage Nico, right? Or Honda or anyone like that. You give them space, right? So, I actually feel like G2 would be better with me, no joke. <laughs> there you go, right in the end, right, you just yeah. snuck <laughs> that in there. Oh, exactly. <laughs> there wasn't even any fucking segue to that. It was like, just sign me instead, of, aka not Alexi B. There we go. <laughs> All right. No, the thing is, though, is it, like, what I'll do is this. Since he mentioned a bunch of the teams anyway, we'll just make this the point. So, the point I had was a very similar one to almost exactly how you framed it, Maui. I just basically put that there are top teams who are just ruining the hierarchy of CSGO. I actually had in brackets, but we'll add a couple more. I actually didn't put G2 with Vitalik, I thought they were too obvious. The other teams I had were some of the ones Huxy said, like, I had Heroic, Ents, Furia, like, C9. Like, these are all teams. Remember, every single one of these teams. G2 as well. I wouldn't put Vitality because the problem with Vitality is it's more like the names demand they be that high up. Aside from that one run they just had now, like they never really did anything this year. But I would say if you look at all those names, Furia, G2, Heroic, Ents, right? If I took a random tournament from 2022, you wouldn't be, I mean, aside from the ones that you would know the results. I mean, if I took like a random one from later in the year, you wouldn't be able to guess now, do they come third or do they come ninth? Like I said earlier. That's a problem in the scene because here's the issue. I don't have any issue if there's incredible variance, but it's because everyone's amazing. If all these teams were playing super high-level Counter-Strike and they just have different map pools and the tournament formats are different and it's just actually people are just legit beating people in better games, that's fine. Now, I know there'll always be a pleb fan, like, but how do you know that isn't happening? How do you know that Mouse just isn't better? Because I have eyes in a brain, you fucking moron. You know, I've watched 20 years of this shit. I'm not like you. I don't have to look on a screen and see that a Serbian guy wrote the number 14 is higher than 12 and go, oh, guess 14 is better. I have a brain, motherfucker. I've seen all the matches. <laughs> so these, this is not a good period of counter -strike. Here's the difference. Uh -oh. At the end of last year, when we all complained in the land circuit, like the top 10 was weak. That was weak, but also the rosters made sense that it was weak. Like those were not very good rosters and everyone needed a roster move after the PGL Stockholm Major. The problem now is the opposite. Everyone seemingly has made the roster moves. Everyone made what looked like, if they're not good roster moves, like ones, like here's the difference. The G2 and Vitality ones, those weren't slam dunks that were work it's just you've got to try that move if it comes across your table like it's like if people don't know back in the day famous this is something a lot of fans might not know you know the super team of phase where they added guardian and all of in 2017 before they played by the way and if you remember the first tournament they actually bombed at dream act malmo there was a lot of people thought that roster wouldn't work by the way because you were adding like the former best players in the world as like extra elements to a team that already exists so a lot of people thought like what if it busts but i tell you what everyone agreed on which is like do you want to be the guy who said no to try in that roster though like if you're carrigan you can't just be like you know what i don't know if all off meister would work so actually i won't I, just give me a random player as my fifth like in that scenario you try it anyway don't you because if it does work it's gonna be the best shit ever which is i'm almost certain what they thought in Vitality and G2. They never really sat down and thought, how would we communicate? They just thought, look, dude, you're Zewu, we're Astralis. Like, it's Apex. Surely we can just almost trip over and make this work. Uh -huh. So there might have been a bit of hubris with that. But my problem basically is just like I say, I, I don't even think it's that these teams are bad. It's just they don't have any level of consistency. Like, in fact, I'll tell you what, we'll transition into my point now. Because my point, I'll pick one specific team. Because the difference with all the other ones, Furia, definitely, I'm at my end of my fucking rope with them. They're also just a team where... 
if it's like the round of 16, they'll play an amazing game and you'll be like, this is a fucking world-class team. And then if they go to like the quarterfinals, anyone can fucking beat this team. It's mental. Like they, they just drop so hard. It's mental. So what I would say is this, the one team I'll pick out, because this one I actually still have reasons to believe could be better. It's actually how bad Ents has been the last oh, few months. Oh, yeah. Because remember, their only good result was with the standing now. Like yeah. ever since the major, look, I get it. It's a major. Everyone peaks for that, blah, blah, blah. Let's do it. But this team had such amazing hype because of how fast they'd risen this year so everyone was hoping actually this would be a team immune from this like they should be a team every tournament this team should be top eight Maui Snake from what we've seen earlier like the map pool was legit the players were legit even Spinks as an individual player was super legit everything looked awesome but these last few months for that team it's like man they've just, it's like they've almost undone all that amazing build up like now they just feel like they're just a random team in the top ten again like I can't here's the difference I can't do what I do with elite teams like and bet that this team would beat like four or five other teams in the top ten I can't do that mostly they would lose one they'd lose one or two yeah it's i this whole the whole thing with uh with ends right now is that i think they're kind of this is i don't want to be right about this but i kind of it seems like they're kind of entering the like snappy igl is getting kind of figured out sort of sort of point okay. with the roster where you know how like every snappy team seems to do pretty well in the beginning honestly and then kind of just like tapers off and i think that with this lineup this this brought snappy to higher highs than he's ever been For at sure, yeah. and i think the kind of calling out a spawn style like you really need to keep innovating with that style and keep bringing new strats to the table or else you just kind of get figured out and teams will understand how how it feels to play against you because kind of the same every round if you can read the play you're going to probably counter whatever the strat is but with with this team i think they might be hitting that point uh as for the individuals on 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 ends though yeah i'm like pretty disappointed because i thought hades was turning a corner at dallas and then he didn't really do anything at this event he was probably it was actually a liability at this event uh so i yeah, for them to come in last, it's just like... because I, I, I thought they were going to beat G2, for sure. By the way, there's also where we've got us. This is where we have to be fair when we're doing these analyses, though. Right? I don't want to hear any fan Maui go... They did come last, but they did play G2 Vitality. We just said a minute earlier, those teams aren't good. Like, at the end of the day, if these teams yeah. aren't good, the, the, you're supposed to beat them if you're in. So of course you are. At least right. one. You know, yeah. beat one, for fuck's sake. The, the playoffs of this event, to me, looked like... Ents was just going to be a shoe in. I thought they, I thought they were just going to make it for sure. Uh, even looking at what their their the group that they were in was not. I felt like the route for them was just not that. I wish I could go back in time, right before Maui Snake boards his plane to come to Europe. Oh, sorry, he lives in Europe, technically. Before he boards his plane to come to Germany, I wish I could just show him just the playoff bracket for I Am Club. I know. Because like, no. it would be such a blast, this, Phil. I know. You'd be like, my <laughs> God. I, got, I was so mad when this when all this unfolded, honestly. It's so, it's so frustrating to see these quarterfinal matchups. Uh, okay, whatever. Either way, yeah, either way. Yeah, point, though, that in is the most reliable team outside of Navi and Face, right? Even though, like, yeah, like obviously I have huge respect for the guys, especially Snappy, because I feel like he doesn't have the, you know, the big names or anything oh, like that. Oh, sure, yeah. Or, or like, yeah, even yeah. though, like, I feel like they are a little bit bigger than than what Flames was basically, and they are number three in the world and they've been there for a while, right? So just adding to your you guys' points, that's like it's insane actually that yeah. <laughs> you know, like a team with. Like, do you have uh, Hades, Sphinx? Like, that's the superstars, I guess, of the team. That's not what you thought. Like, there was a period of time, is it like maybe half a year, year ago, th that everybody made those changes with like Rubs to Face and Vitality Project and G2 and all that stuff. And everybody was looking for those roster moves. Yeah, Nobody yeah. looked at the ends, right? No, at no. that time. And then all of a sudden, they're just actually doing better than any of them. So, yeah, I think that's. Obviously, respect to Snobby for making that work, but I definitely feel like that also as to the point of people being unstable. This for sure. all of this, all of this whole like three through eleven ranked teams just being as poor as they are, unfortunately, makes me start to have these like more existential dread, dreadful moments where I'm Come just on. like, I'm like, does this game even have a high skill ceiling? There you go. Okay. <laughs> oh, <it's> just, <laughs> no, no, like, we're going to a dark place. <laughs> I know. It's like it, it's not like Valorant, like where just shooting people is just so easy in that game. But but this, but I'm starting to feel like people are almost getting so mechanically skilled now that it just feels so random sometimes who wins duels 
uh even if the worst for me mate is this it actually it's when i do my betting stuff that's when i start to almost like wonder like is this all is this real because basically when you see the odds are really big for the underdog in, in, if this was like fucking boxing or whatever, I would just take the big favourite every time, wouldn't I? But it's Counter-Strike, so it's like, I start going like, it's a BO1 though, isn't it? And it's yeah. the fucking first day. And, and then you just think of all the million BO1s of like the best team ever losing to some shitter team. And suddenly you can make any result possible in your mind. Like you can actually just trick yourself completely. Like it's too easy to just, because if the odds are high enough, you just find a way, ah, but it could happen. And if they lost two pistols and then the fourth gun round, like you, it just ruins the whole thing. Like it makes me feel like it's <laughs> yeah. all a legit sport. Even though it is, like... On the, that's the sad thing. On the one hand, it is, but I agree. The short-term results make it look stupid. I, of course. Uh, another... Oh, shit. What was I going to say? Oh, another thing is that I think that actually this makes me just like really... The grass is so green with, with a normal sports franchise league system where basically throughout the regular season, everybody can kind of coast and just play to their average level the whole time. And then they ramp up for playoffs and then you have these incredible matches because everybody's peaking at this yes. perfect time. But for, for CS, because it's so like two weeks in this place, two weeks in that place, this event matters, this event matters, it's almost like the 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 roster, or not the roster, the schedule gets so jam-packed with events that it's like, should you peak for this event? Should you just ramp up for this event? And I, I like that people like Kerrigan have made it abundantly clear now that he only really cares about four events a year, two majors, Cologne. Dude, I actually Pizza. think that's really cool, what you said earlier. If they really did do that, because I would, I, would, I would think of all the people Kerrigan would, I mean, he's just won the major and he obviously yeah. can win the Grand Slam. The idea of like, look, play the online shit a cop, but just use it for like practice a map or fuck around with your map pools. That's quite a good sort of innovation to do because obviously yeah. everyone just otherwise would go, just don't attend the event. So like you've got to attend the events. So like there's no choice of that. So, but that's a, that's quite a good angle to use, though. Right. As you say, you can't try and peek at every event. It just doesn't work by definition. Just, just yeah, I think just using other events almost as like it does take away from the quality of the yeah, event, of obviously. But like, if we just really do make it abundant, just so clear to everybody in the space that. I am Dallas is not an event that FaZe practice for or something like that. I don't know if they, I don't think that's the case. I think they practice for it, but I don't, you, you can be sure I mean, that like they didn't four play days it. after the major or something, so they can't, yeah. can't practice that much, but yeah, sure. Exactly. So they, they <laughs> didn't really, they probably just flew there. They yes. probably just coasted into that one. And uh, that's, that's, uh, I don't know. That's, that's kind of like my main, maybe a big gripe with this, but I also think like, there's no reason that these rank three to 11 teams shouldn't adopt this a similar mentality i've got another angle though for you guys and here's one of the reasons why which is i actually think this isn't i hadn't thought this before but i actually don't think it's all the fault of like the scene or teams i actually think part of the problem also is if you think of who the players in these teams are notice most of these teams we're listing have like players who weren't top land players before we went online before the whole online period, the, it, look, these aren't teams that are like, look, yeah, you have, yes, on the one hand, you have Dupree, but then you have like fucking Masuta. Yes, you have like fucking yeah, yeah, yeah. Snappy, but you have Spinks. In fact, the entire ends team, by the way, is yeah. totally inexperienced players. Like the problem there basically is this, what the online era robbed us of, Gambit's the best example ever for this, in my opinion. They would never, ever have been criticised the way they have if they'd have started on LAN because they wouldn't have won the events. They would have just been like this really cool team that was coming like quarterfinals and like winning on, say, like overpass and fucking vertigo. And everyone was like, ooh, specialists, we better watch out for this team. And then what would happen is in the year and a half of online play, maybe now those players would be fully veterans, like they'd be ready to perform. If you notice, almost all these teams are players that are good enough because of the online, online, offline bullshit to be in the top a tier one but they're not super vets they don't have like incredibly well-rounded resumes and long that, that's got to be a factor as well i think yes. if you notice for teams yeah. like heroic gambit etc and that really counts for these ones a lot the other ones like the g2 and vitality the rosters just haven't worked but these ones i feel like inexperience is also another factor because remember the part of the problem there if you think hooksy is there's not like you can't measure that it's just like an intangible quality isn't it so as much as everyone says like they need experience it's not like just a random amount like five events does it like oh i've done my five now i take over and i'm really good like it, it, some it's players amazing. never get that good on land some players get amazing yeah exactly you can't know can you you can't know when they're gonna get good yeah what have you and thought that on that angle because you must have noticed that as well like even in the modern days there's another reason the circuit was a bit dodgy like when we watch that Rubek Cup and all those online cups, mate. Again, the fucking results on those are nothing like land would ever be in a million years. Like same teams just get five times better. Top teams get five times worse. You must yeah. have noticed the impact the last couple of years. 
Yeah, obviously. Like, just a quick point. In the quarterfinal, we had against Inns. Nine out of ten players had never been on the stage before. Like a go. real stage. There you and go, that's right. just insane to think about. It's a quarter the World Championship, right? Yeah. right? <laughs> yes. But um, yeah, anyway, I think it's kind of hard for for teams to actually do that stuff of like prioritizing uh, events. You just see, like, I don't want to get into the whole Blastralis uh, thing, right? But obviously, actually, I feel like that kind of worked for them because they <laughs> have somewhat of a break at the Berlin Major or like before that. And then. Yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, they just played insanely well again, right? So, to some extent, I feel like it could work, but you have to be careful. Just even for a team like us, uh, when we went from not not that it's, it's an excuse at all because that's not what we did. But let's say that we actually took a little bit of a break after the first major, and then we kind of just played around with new stuff and innovated a little bit for the next upcoming online cups. People would still trash talk us from now and until Christmas or something, right? Because, yeah, obviously people expect us to do better now that we did a good run at the Major, right? So I think it's, like, there's obviously pros and cons with it, right? Uh, and I definitely think that people were after face as well. And they got a lot of uh, bad DMs after the Rupert Cup and, and stuff like that. So you, you obviously have to, to be in the right... Uh, headspace i guess to to do stuff like that but but i definitely think that's that's the future like you 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 can't keep doing what we're doing at the moment and um i remember a special period can't really remember what year it was but there was at some time uh, where people had to go to like free events and they didn't even had have, have time to to finish the final before they had to fly over the atlantic again to play like yes yeah. Another event, and that's just like how do you expect quality CS from that? that that's just yes. ridiculous, right? So, uh, but yeah, I I, th I think if I was in like a team that had to go from event to event, I would definitely look at this and think about like sh should it should we actually go to every event we got invited to? I probably wouldn't. I think that's too much stress. Right, let's move on then. So the last category is obviously the ugly category, right? Hoxy, what was your ugly category? Uh, I, I guess to some it's a bit of a boring one, but uh, there was some drama on Twitter the other day about the uh, CSPPA um, getting claimed by literally everyone, I guess, um, for rescheduling the player break. And that's not the first time that happened that they get claimed for something uh, where I think... Did you think it was unjustified? Or is it just the premise that they're being flamed you bothered by? Uh, I definitely think it's unjustified, even though I don't... Like, the thing is, I don't think anyone is doing a perfect job at, oh, of course. like, the whole thing with, like, CSPPA or whatever. Um, but I definitely feel like the players are, you know, pretty fast when it comes to writing shit on Twitter and, and just in general shit-talking uh, CSPPA. I feel like that's an organization that is, they have good intentions. They're not professional or, like, good at what they're doing yet. But to say that they didn't... Like, they found out about all of this on Twitter is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Like, I, I, I looked in, we have, like, a WhatsApp group that everybody is a part of, right? I looked at that, like, maybe two and a half, three weeks ago, and they... So, basically, yeah. it was implied, like, just so the story, we get the story correct for fans who don't know this drama. Basically, when CSPPA announced the dates for the player break, players who are professional players sort of implied, like, but we weren't told about this, even though, obviously, they have, like, representatives who represent them for the CSPPA. Yes. They just sort of implied there was no communication or something, or it's the wrong dates or something. Yeah, and what actually happened was that CSPPA wrote uh, a message in the WhatsApp group like two and a half weeks ago or something asking if people were thinking about like if this was, was this a good idea or not and should we do it? And I think they got maybe five or six responses. And right. if you think about how many pro teams there actually yeah. are, then that's... Are there a million teams in this group? Is everyone in it basically? No, no it's not everyone, but I, like I would say that's maybe like between 40 and 50 members. So I would so say like... It's all the top ranked teams, etc. then, yeah. Yeah, maybe 10% or something actually responded to that message, right? right? Where I feel like, okay, then... And, and all the responses were positive, I'll just say that as well. Like, okay. everybody thought it was a good ah, idea. Right. Nobody right. said anything bad about it. I didn't say anything myself, because I don't give a fuck. Like, I, I have my break when I have my break. I don't have uh, anything I have to do. I'll just chill when whenever. Um, so I, di I didn't really care, and I thought to myself, like, okay, if if all the responses are positive, and they're not getting a response from me, I expect it to happen, right? Um, but when they actually announced on Twitter uh, that they were going through with the stuff, then, well, I won't say names, but 
<laughs> a lot, of, yeah, a yeah. lot of people suddenly woke up, right? Uh, where I feel like that was just unjustified to to flame them so hard, and I feel like that's not the first time. And I think we should consider ourselves lucky that somebody actually wants to do stuff like this uh, to try to make the scene better. Uh, so, yeah, I actually reached out to CSPPA to say that if I had some time off and they wanted some help, I would definitely be there to help, right? Because I, I actually moly. Been like, I've just I've just clicked the quote tweets for the tweet, mate. Fucking no, hell, they are indeed tweet. beating their ass in the no, quote tweet. No, it, because it's it it all like commentators it's and stuff. Ridiculous. There's like fucking player, fucking agents jumping in. Because here's what's yeah. wild about it, right? That what they've done on this, I've seen as well as this, right? People are taking it as though, like every quote tweet, by the way, makes it look like it's just obvious that they're all CSPPA morons and they didn't send any emails to anyone. Like they, may, everyone makes it sound super cut and dry. Yeah, I don't get it. I, I feel like obviously there could be some problem with people actually leaving that WhatsApp group and whatever, and there could be a better set system of instead of replying in the WhatsApp group, they could maybe get some kind of a voting system and then you have until a specific date and then people... That's what I suggested that we should do for the next time. But but at the end of the day, you had to answer a message with something quick. And if you answered, I need more time to think about this, then fine, then they would probably wait until whatever date to actually publish it, right? And this is not the first time. And it's not the first time I see a ton of players Maybe it's a month ago. That... I actually noticed as well. One thing I'd like to ask is, what do you think, like, in terms of how many people complain publicly, is that all the people you think are upset? Because here's the other thing I've noticed. The reason why it seems like people who aren't players are getting involved and also, like, bagging on CSPPA is because they actually are getting the sense that, like, none of the players will consult. They're getting like, oh, no one asked us. Like, it sounds t- like, essentially, what you're saying, by the way, is what I've heard ev- the entire time I've been in esports. People who are pro players in Counter-Strike never, ever check those bloody groups or they don't reply to emails. They don't. If people don't know, the reason why every single fucking tournament ever that has a, one of those bog scenarios where it's like, oh, they did damage at the beginning of the round, was one person hit on the round or not like no one ever reads those rule books until that rule it gets invoked like no one reads it in advance well, except the germans bizarrely but everyone else who's a normal human just waits until the fucking rule happens and then everyone goes what is the rule like that's pro players react they don't get ahead of the problem so like the problem i have with this hooksy is i could totally believe the story you're saying that they all were in this group but just no one fucking checked and then they just saw that tweet and they were like what the hell i wasn't informed about that but like you did have your chance like what, what if it was an email I think I know the answer, but if it was an email, I don't think it'd be any different, right? If this was a chain email no, no. to all the teams, they would just still ignore it. So yeah, it'd, be, yeah, yeah. it'd be unread in their fucking email box. Come on. Yeah. There was also a lot of, like, uh, you know, excuses that they didn't have time to actually think about it and then give a response. Where okay. I was just like, okay, then we'd make a, a voting okay. system, but would it ever help? And then, yeah, I don't know. I guess the only thing I can say with actually putting a name on is that FaZe didn't have a person in the group for whatever reason. It's been a group for like a billion years, and they obviously know that it's a group, uh, especially after the the bug that happened after the major that group was uh, going oh, crazy. Right. So right. yeah, uh, I, I don't know why they don't have a person in there, but whatever. Um, but in general, I'm just so tired of watching people complain about no changes, but they don't want to take any responsibility for stuff. And I, I just wanted that out there because I feel yeah, like yeah. That's, ridiculous right you see anyway that's why i asked for the distinction was it actually like the issue you had a problem it's more like the trend that players just flame the cspa yeah, yeah, immediately yeah. without even knowing what they're talking about yeah yeah i i want to like i want to say i feel like nobody is perfect in this scenario like cspa could have done a way better job so could the players though and i feel like sure. that's al- always what's getting hidden sure. under the carpet a little bit right that, that the players could actually do something as well so yeah i hope that will change at some point at least Probably yeah. not. Probably. I mean, I'm glad, I'm glad you bring this up just because there was so much pushback and like not many people expressed that they were positive about the change when making a player break after a major just is just how it should be. Like that just seems the most lo- logical right now. I mean, like because we were just lamenting over the fact that that Dallas event just felt like, is this really how serious That's is not this? not an event, right? It's yeah. Just, uh, I, I don't even know. What, like I, I wouldn't even go there if you like, if it was me, you'd be like... That the, how many teams had a stand in or something like that? Oh, yeah, there was six, a lot. seven yeah. teams or something like that. Right, right. There, there's, a, there's a few like the reasons to go for it are if you're a grand slam in, a, in the running for a grand slam because that's a million dollars that you're maybe leaving on the table if you don't win it or go to it if you're in the run. But the other is like 
just you just kind of want to get a, a win under your belt or like just farm some teams that are kind of weaker if you feel yeah. like but but yeah i i mean we've we've seen we see this every single time that after a tournament after a major is just a little bit weaker than it should be or people are just taking a break and stuff and like it's almost like so many people put it upon themselves to take their own self like they just take their own you know they just take their own break so just make it a make it a unified yeah uh, my just, own situation as well like i i, I missed uh a tournament, uh, the Pinnacle tournament in Lund, that was a LAN. Mm -hmm. Then I missed uh, Dallas. I would probably have been at Cologne as well, to some extent, maybe the plane or something. And I've just been sitting here on my ass doing actually, like absolutely nothing for an entire month now, and I'm losing my mind slowly. So <laughs> I would love for the player break to actually be after the major, but um, yeah, I don't know. You're about to be in another break for like a month. Yep. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. It's incredible. Okay. What I found so weird about this story, though, is exactly as you say, that the, the, the real issue is, as far as I can tell, because I've been reading through the replies, even from these pros and the, looking at like, the way they're framing it, as far as I can tell, they're just literally having a tantrum that they personally weren't consulted. It's not even, as far as I can tell, Maui, that they disagree with the decision. Oh. Like, I haven't seen anyone whose comments, like, there shouldn't be the break at that point, or, like, I want the break before a major. Like, it's just as far as I can tell, people having, like, an ego trip of, like, I didn't vote for this. Who did? Did you vote for this? It's like, you all had the opportunity to vote, yeah, I would yeah, guess. Yeah. I'd just imagine you are all lazy fucking professional video game players. Yeah. These are the fuckers. You, you can't get some of these guys to watch a demo of their opponent in a world championship. You think they're going to apply to a fucking WhatsApp group? Fat chance of that. And the reason I hate this as well is because, mate, I've always... This is one of the reasons, Maui Snake, why I'm, A, one of the realest people ever, but, B, will never be popular with pro players. Because when I go to events and pro players try saying this stupid shit to me, I just tell them straight up, like, who the fuck are you? You just click the buttons, mate. We do the talking and thinking. You just fucking shut up, click those buttons and look away when a flashbang comes on your computer monitor, you moron. I've never done that in my entire life. Looked away. I'd, not, guess what, Elise? When I duck in the game, I can just keep my head parallel. I don't, oh, bloody hell, I'm going to get under this. Like, the fuck dream logic are you on, mate? You in a David Lynch movie or something? So anyway, right, when I'm going to these events, the thing I can't handle is when pros complain like that. Cause it's like, yeah, but you're implying you know what you want. If there's one thing pros don't know, it's what they want. I'll give you two pieces of trivia. I don't know if Hooksy's old enough or if he was in the pro scene to know these details. Pro players voted for these two things. Pro players chose to have that major before the Berlin major that ruined every top team's form. They chose to have the player break right before that. Pro players voted within ESL to make round-robin group stage with best of ones, the format for Pro League, oh. if you remember, a couple of years back. By the way... Not only have we already had that through most of Counter-Strike history, it's probably everyone's least favourite format, if you actually ask people. But what happened was, because pros had just had a few years of doing GSL system, they just heard there's a different system. They're like, yeah, duh, that sounds better. I didn't like that time I got eliminated in the GSL. This, this is fairer. And they all voted for that shit. And the joke is, when it then later on turns out to be shit, by the way, those pros are shameless. They won't come out and go, look, well, I did vote for that. And, you know, it did turn out to be bad. So, like, can we change? They'll just come out later like this format. So Sucks. And like the joke is like you guys don't know it in public, but I do. Sometimes that's the motherfucker who voted for that. And now he's going like ESL really need to change their form. It's like they yeah, their mistake, mate, was letting you choose. If I was ESL, I'd just pick what I think's best and go, you could just fucking play or get on your bike, mate. So like the players the problem with this topic basically is people know this anyway. So I have that rule that if you take a pro player's age, you have to subtract five off the number. And that's how they that's like their emotional age. So if they're twenty, <laughs> they're actually just a fifteen year old kid. That's why they'll be raging their tits off when they lose. <laughs> Similarly, right? Pro players, it's, it's like herding cats. Like it's hard enough getting them in the server to play the game. They're not going to fucking figure out the whole scene for us guys. The only problem we have here, which is the final point I would make, is this, right? In theory, everyone could just be like me and be like, look, we're the businessmen. We set the tournament up. We do it this way. These are the rules. But the problem is this. In the modern day, all the companies in esports really do care about what you call optics, like how it, things appear in public. So unfortunately, even though the pro players maybe shouldn't have this say, like they don't decide how like the fucking tennis tournaments run or whatever. The problem is, in the modern day, if you get flamed by players, that has a really powerful effect on the companies though. Like they do care about that. People like ESL and Valve, I don't know about Valve, but the TOs do care about being flamed and the perception that players don't like the decisions or players vote against it. So it'll always be relevant. In that sense, I think CSPPA and these decisions, like this, this will happen again. Put, there's, there's my prediction, by the way. This will happen again in the next years. Because the bizarre thing, if I bring it all back to the beginning, is as far as I can tell, 
don't we all agree with this news? Isn't this exactly what we've all asked for the last like year? Just like have player breaks after majors as a way to divide the season. I think that's what we all want, isn't it? So to me, that's why it's, it's just a bit of diva shit, isn't it? They're all raging about this. And as we say, I think Huxley's nailed it. They almost certainly, it was probably their fuck up that they didn't get to vote, if I had to guess. If it turns out it isn't, by the way, then go to a journalist if you're a player and show them that it's not the case. Show you weren't consulted. I suspect there won't be anything then. None of them will do that. I think they'll all just pitch and whine now and then they'll just get back on with whatever they were doing in the game and fucking go back to sleep or playing Fortnite or whatever the fuck they were doing when they should have replied to that WhatsApp group. I will, I will add, though, that uh, just in terms of, like, f first of all, there was no, like, positive feedback on Twitter from me, for example, because I feel like taking those discussions on Twitter is just childish, but whatever. Okay. Um, but uh, I will say that people were mad that they couldn't go on vacation with their families now because the player break was outside of the normal, you know, vacation time, whatever, uh, at least in the... So this is next year, though, right? This is for 2023. Uh, yeah, but like if you, for example, if you have, uh, people book know, their like, holiday that yeah, far in advance. Yeah, well, in advance. I was confused. I was really, really confused about why okay. they say they can't hang out with their families now. What, what is well, what is normal some, vacation time? Some some people like, for example, let's let's take a guy like Sonic. He has kids, right? Uh, maybe I don't know how old his kids actually are, but I could I could imagine like in Denmark we have something where the the vacation for the school is actually... Oh, the summer break or something like week. that. Oh, right, yeah. the sort of six yeah. weeks or four weeks okay. off in yeah. the summer. And if yeah, you have okay. a certain job as well, I guess if their girlfriend or wife's... Now my only thing okay. that I can think about right now is actually being a teacher, right? But that would also be summer breaks and you can't actually choose your own vacation. You have to go on that time, sure, yeah. But I just feel like it's such a narrow audience that it actually yeah, okay. you know, caters to that... I don't know. But that that's something that you actually could have dis discussed if you were looking into this yeah, stuff yeah. and you actually wanted to vote or create a discussion and then actually come up with something good. And that's where the whole issue is for me that, you know, people just instantly go on Twitter and flame for nobody actually coming to them. Like, do we have to fucking call you and your parents to, sure. to actually do something or can you actually do something yourself? Sure. And obviously I won't get any good feedback for saying this or become no uh, no player, people think you're a traitor or something somebody, so somebody has to like you know <laughs> yeah fair it. play so i will say as well there is an, one last aspect that i should just for fairness shade in here which is unfortunately csppa in english you would say like they made the rod for their own back to be beaten with because True. since they mishandled that first year so badly by the way do you think it's a coincidence half of it was battle against me and by the way i don't lose on twitter so they just got fucking tooled for a whole year and look stupid didn't they so the problem with that right is even though this is the worst thing csppa now isn't at all the same people the actual people in charge aren't the same and even the player reps aren't the same so it's not the same org but for Watch when you see the words CSPPA, everyone just yeah. thinks of the same group and everyone thinks everything they do is... It's like what's happening with ESIC now, where everyone's yeah. turning the corner on ESIC. Now, every single thing ESIC does, even if it's something good's going to be like, ah, fuck up, it's ESIC. Like, <laughs> they've sort of got yeah. like a, just a negative rep following them. They're like a negative momentum follows this org now, unfortunately. So even when they're right, like I say, I think everyone agrees, except for like people who bizarrely have to have a holiday with their fucking wife in Denmark or something in one year from now. Yeah, well, guess what? You, you specific guy, I think you might just have to fucking make do, might you? <laughs> Yes. You fuck. <laughs> we can't run our whole lives on you, you literal <laughs> selfish bastard. Like, fucking hell. Outrageous, that is. I know, isn't it? Like, and you're just a professional video game player. Like, it's not like we have to care that you have a family or whatever. Let's fucking get on with it. There's plenty of losers without families. They'll kick your ass in this game. So fucking level up, Zonic, whoever it is. Whoever it is. Whoever yeah, it is. Uh, right, anyway, let's I move on. Let's I don't move even on. remember. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It's someone, it's someone who has a kid or a family, though, clearly. So <laughs> yeah. start narrowing it down, fans. Sure. <laughs> Process sure. of elimination. So okay. what about yeah. this, then? Let's move Maui on. Snake, what is your yeah, argument yeah. point? Okay. By the way, this I love this as well. In the same way as I gave credit to Huxley earlier, what I love about this is this is where you know Maui has truly become. He's actually entering almost like veteran status on events, which sounds weird because you think he hasn't done that many events. When you know you've actually become a hardened veteran on events is when you get this take he's about to give because essentially what you do is... Like, I don't just dislike underdogs and upsets. I fucking hate them, Maui Snake, because they ruin my job <laughs> yeah, and my yeah, literal yeah. enjoyment. Of yeah. the so I, I'll just say I hate them. Like, I don't hate them individually, obviously. They should play the best they can. But your point now, like, this is the level of haterism I've been at for years. So come on, hit me with it. What? The thing about, like, this tournament's going on, Cologne. Think of all the brilliant storylines, Huxley. So what possible 
What possible angle could Maui have that's ugly here? What is okay. the angle? Maui, come on, hit my, us. Okay, well, my, yeah, my ugly is that it's just it's just Maui's making it to playoffs. Yes! It's I love just... it. I love it. The pure <laughs> haterism. Dude, they're, they're supposed to try this. It's their lives and careers, but fuck them. I hate them. I hate everything about them. <laughs> No, it's just, oh, it's just like, like coming into this event. There's just no reason to consider this team to be anywhere near the level of a top yeah. six team at an event like Cologne. But you know, they did it, and it's just like now we have to witness them. You know, maybe fucking up a bracket too. You know, who knows? Yes. But uh, uh, basically, I mean, I'll say this. The thing with Mao's that's weird about it, like if I actually get into their tactics too, is that I feel like they just made one very simple change, and then they just started winning because of it. And that's just that. When Dexter was calling and why everybody was not sold on Dexter, myself included, is that despite, other than the single Flashpoint 3 win that they had, like, there was never a single time that anybody got excited about this team because the way that they play just always felt like they default, they'd spread out, and they die one by one by one all across the map, and there would never even be a trade. And then now what we're getting with Maus is that... They've simplified their style a lot where they'll default for the first 50 seconds and literally at one minute they will basically just group up and go somewhere together. And that's it. They'll just five man. They don't even leave lurkers most of these rounds anymore. They just group up and go. And it's like, I think people are just surprised that this is their style and that it's catching teams off that maybe are under preparing for them. But when Astralis plays them in the quarterfinals now, I, if Astralis doesn't, there's no way that, that, uh, that Glaive and that team doesn't recognize what's going on. And so I think they're just going to get their shit kicked in. And I think that we were potentially robbed of it being like an NIP Astralis game, which would have been a sick matchup in comparison to now having Mouse there. And, you know, like, it's cool that Torzy looked pretty sick at times. It's cool that, like, I think I think Frozen is very good as an individual. And I think that Bemis is, like, a rising star, actually. I think he's, I think he's kind of getting, he's really getting close to being, like, a guy you would consider a star player. Um, he probably, I mean, he very well could be uh their best player but i think it's still frozen so but i, I just think like it, it's just kind of like in terms of the narrative and i think that's why thorin loves this because because like really as as analysts we'd like to pit, build these matchups like nip you know with hampus and res and it's like wow they're like they're coming together like it's like everything's just slowly ascending with brolin now and now we just have jdc like like it's okay. It's it's just it's just not what it could have been. It's just not that's all. It's just not where. It, and I th I just think when people understand their tactics, they're gonna get figured out really hard, really fast. Oh, I have I haven't watched enough mouse to actually say if what you're saying. No is one has. Or not. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, I feel like I feel like you can't even like blame me for not watching them. But, no, no, um, no, of course. But I, I will say, just for Frozen, I feel like I can be happy for them. I feel like he. Oh, he for sure. That he's, it feels like he's been around forever, even though he's still a really young guy, right? Uh, but I actually don't know what... Like, are they just playing a good event for once, or what's going on? Because I feel like... Their T sides they... are better than their CT sides, for example, of how, how unsustainable this is. Just like, they're the only team that I think has a better T side win rate than CT side win rate, which that's, is just... That's damn impressive in this middle right now, I it, feel like... It is. It is. It, it's impressive, but it also just feels so fluky. Like, it, it, again, you know, that's mm. that's the one thing for me. They, they have the best T side of the entire tournament, actually. And their uh, CT side win rate is the lowest ct side win rate of any team like it it's turning it's turning counter-strike on its head in terms of these mouse games and it's you know it's unique it's a unique viewing experience but it's also like i i just think that this style that they play is not like that, that, that is gonna kind of makes it, it feels like a fluke right yeah. that everything is just like the other way <laughs> so it's just backwards. suddenly yeah. yeah yeah all of a sudden you just have to like yeah, think differently about. I don't know. I feel like <coughs> maybe Cyclone, that coach, could have something to do with it because I've played with him myself. It, actually, the first time I played for Flames, and we definitely don't agree on how to play CS. I could say that for sure. Mm. But he has a very, I don't know, unique, weird style. Uh, uh, that if maybe he got more input or something, that could be it. Mm. Uh, besides that, I don't really know. Like, I honestly haven't watched. A single mouse demo in two months, I think. So <laughs> yeah. I, I, I honestly don't know. The problem with this team, basically, is like Maui says, if you're an analyst, it's that they just sort of ruin the narrative, unfortunately. Like, it's not as interesting a matchup. And then also probably won't be a very good stage match. I'm sorry, that match will probably be shit. And then guess what? One of Mouse and Astralis gets to come top four at IEM Cologne. Like, that sort of does... Listen, 
They did beat teams to do it, but that's sort of that's not a cool story, I'm afraid. It just isn't. That's not a, a feel-good story that everyone's going to love and think back on fondly. In fact, it actually will be looked back at. People will look back and see that bracket and go, what the hell happened here? And then they'll have to be told the story of, like, well, G2 and Vitality weren't good, and it really could end semester tournament. Like, they'll have all that shit one basically. So that, that angle's bad. And then I also just think, they're just also not actually that good a team. That's the problem. This isn't like... Because here's the other thing. They've had this lineup a while now. There's a few months. Like, this isn't like they just made this roster move and, wow, this... Wow, what, if this was their first event ever with this five man yeah. line, hey, maybe there's something to this. Because I'll give the example I gave before. This is the opposite of the FaZe example I gave. You know, I said how oh, when FaZe was winning all those tournaments, like every playoff series would have like close moments or it'd be like a back and forth match or both teams are fragging well and FaZe was just winning out every 50 50 game. Well, Mouse, if people don't know, were never bad. Like this lineup actually used to always be that close to upsetting teams over and over and over and over and over again. Like what they would do in every tournament was just start the event out, go three maps with someone, lose an OT, go three maps with someone, lose on the third map, like almost win a game on the second map, but then go three maps and lose. They would do that over and over again. And you did feel like, oh, they're going to break through eventually. It's like this event, they just broke through, but then continuously. Like the problem I have is I would imagine that when you regress back to the main, I actually think the who they were in the other tournaments is who they are as a team. The problem with this squad is this. They are actually a good team to have upset potential. They're a kind of little, like, upset team where if they get the right opponent in terms of map pool, and especially, I would actually say the reason they're actually an underrated squad is because if you actually look at the raw five-man roster, I actually think the roster's slightly underrated. It's sort of like a slightly weaker version of Ents, basically. They've got a trio of stars who, in their own way, are good. The problem they have is, like, Frozen's good, but he's not Sphinx. Like, Sphinx actually is, like, a level above... Torsi's maybe like 50-50 with Hades. Like BMAS, I actually agree with you. I think BMAS the last three months or so has come on leaps and bounds, actually looking competent as a player now. The problem they have beyond that is, and still has players to... I've got named players to name. Like Dexter's not a good IGL, mate. Maybe he's okay. Maybe I'll give him that. Maybe he's okay. It's not a great IGL. It's just obvious. He's had all these different players... He's never really made anything of it. So I feel like maybe IGLs a change. In general, as a team, the problem I have is, like I say, I don't mind them as a squad. I just think they're sort of upset fodder. Like, they can upset a team, but they're not going to do anything themselves. Like, I would be very, very shocked if they do anything in the playoffs at this tournament. I think that would be, like, an, an incredible surprise if they can. Fair play if they can, but I don't think they can. Come on. Yeah. I, I basically, like, to close this one out for me, it's just, like... If they, if this is the start of a journey for Maus where they start making it into all, every playoff, then I'll look like a fool. But I, I would bet a lot that I'm not. But I, I bet a lot that this is just kind of the one-off for them. So that's it. Uh, right. The last will, point I, I have. Say, I will say just fast that they could easily beat Astralis in a quarterfinal. Because oh, it's not they, impossible. Yeah, like, sure. Like, yeah. Astralis is the, kind of the same thing right now, right? Yes. They, they, they have been so inconsistent for whoever, like however long. So. Yeah, I, I feel like they could do something in the playoff, but when they hit Navi, I feel like it's just going to, going to be a brick roll. So, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Right, the, the last topic I have, it actually sort of touches on something we talked about earlier since some of the other names got thrown in on the good. So basically, all I put is Cloud9 Fragility. Oh, man. Because the problem I have is this. This is where I can tell so many fans are about to have a really bad three months of Counter-Strike. Because here's what they all think about Snake. They all either think before Dallas, they were like, Cloud9 just sucks, it'll never be good. Then when they won Dallas, some people are like, wow, actually they were good all along. And now they're like, nah, they suck again. It's like, it's it's both and neither, you idiots. It's I so obviously both and neither. Like, basically, the reason I say my point isn't just Cloud9. I put Cloud9's fragility. It's because what I don't get about this team, this is why I'll be very interested to see what Hooksy says. I'm not like he's practiced them a bunch. What I don't get about this team, Hooksy, is they only have two settings. Like, most top teams who are, like, top five in the world, it's like this. You have your A game where you play amazingly. All the players play great. You call a great game. Everything works out but after that you have like the b game the c game and you know you're still pretty good like if you go and play it like against navi for example like dude even their c game can beat most teams in the world like just essentially just fragging and just having players play well the problem with gambit is this or c9 is their a game looks really good it's how they can win events like i am dallas but fucking hell as soon as they drop off they just become so much worse. It's crazy. Like, I feel like for real, when this team isn't on their game, I don't even know if they're a top 10 team sometimes. It's mental. And that can happen player-wise as well. Like, I have to say, the player I tend to get hung up on, even though Hobbit's had the drop-off, it's still Shiro for me. Because, dude, he is either the best player in the server or just, like, an, an average player. 
There's no in-between again. I don't know why, but it's such a, a night and day player to me. And that's the thing. Normally, when you can put up the numbers, this guy can at his peak. Usually, those are the consistent players, dude. Like, in theory, he's like a beta opera. That's supposed to be the most consistent style in Counter-Strike. You just get all, like, the 2K every fucking round and then save your gun. Like, But what's bizarre is he's really up and down, even as a player himself. What do you guys think? What's the what, Why are they so fragile? I don't know if I agree with your your whole thing about Shiro. I feel like Shiro is actually pretty consistent from what I've seen. I feel like the whole thing about... It's going back to what I said earlier about Nefeli. I feel like so much of their style and everything like that evolves about, around him. So I feel like if he's having a really bad day, I actually feel like you can say the same thing about NIP right now. It's like... The Orba is pretty passive and he's like a supportive kind of element in the team. So he's not going out there like turning the game around if the IGL is having a bad day. And I don't know. I feel like the, they, they do have, they, like, they have an A game and they have a B game. But in between, there's kind of like Hobbit, you know? Because he can actually have a pop-off game and then he can kind of save if Nev... Nev is he the one who has game. to rescue them if the game goes to shit? Yeah, 100%. Right. Uh, but, right. I, but I definitely feel like it's all up to Nefany. Like, if Nefany yeah. has a bad game, then it looks like it, it's in this tournament, for example. I, I pin basically all the all the flaws of Cloud9 on Nafany, and I really, like, I went really, I went pretty hard on him on one of the other episodes of this show, and I still, I'm not backing down from the fact that I think this team is is too much so dictated by Nafany's ups and downs, and I think that this event, Cologne, was a huge down for him. I, I talked about it on uh, the desk a bunch already, and I, I just like to put it here, like, what, what he did, what he called... 1311 against Liquid ruined that game, that comeback for them on Dust 2. They basically, they were coming back, they won like seven or six of the last eight rounds, then he suddenly goes for a double op on T-side Dust 2. It doesn't work, the first, he basically wanted to go for a long spawn pick, but he keeps the op for the, they, they, they don't, they don't, he doesn't get the pick, they try to do this mid to B play, but because they have two ops, they just decide to save, and then the next round, he actually gets to A, and just like misses every shot with the off and it was like dude like why did you even change what you guys were doing they would have they would have made the comeback against liquid they would have ma made liquid look like chokers but then nafany decided to do something that just was completely out of the game plan there's no way that if you like you would be i would be shocked if groove was okay with that kind of move like i bet you groove was like nafany don't do this don't don't fucking do this but nafany just decided to do it and the guy is like too inconsistent for me and i feel like maybe like i don't know if i would say emotional but just like it's just so all over the place with him as a leader and that's why that's why this team can have essentially two top seven players in the world in axel and shiro statistically and still find ways to lose games it's it's just crazy because like you don't see teams that are that have though like that many that much star power it's it's like it, it is akin to electronic simple in that regard and yet they just aren't even relevant in some tournaments. They don't even make it to the playoffs. They... By the way, though, a point you make, though, that I think ties into this angle on the Fari, though, because when you make it, actually, now I think about it, same with what Huxley was saying earlier, that is a key thing this team doesn't have. Even though, as you say, if you have a look, they're always, if, assuming they haven't had the odd, really terrible tournament, they're going to always have top players, like you say, yeah. two, two star players. The difference between their star players, here's the difference, Huxley. If you take the other star players in the world... If the game's going bad, they just do what they need to do to win the game, mate. Like, the individual yeah, player just yes. break the system, win the game. Like, they don't have anyone like that on no. C9. They seem to just lose as a team. It's like they just agree, like, what's the attack that we're doing? Didn't work, we just lose as a team. Like, Shiro's not going to go and just fucking start just, like, combat hopping someone. He's just going to stay in his spot. If he doesn't get a shot, if he misses his shot, it's the end of the round. I think and it's that... only Hobbits that can do that. And I yeah. also didn't... Wasn't it you, Maui, that actually talked a lot about the flesh the six, uh, stats as well? Yeah, their flash assists are always, like, not negligible. They're the yeah, worst in every so tournament, So there's really oh. nothing to fall back on. Like, I, I feel like they have, great, they have great team play if they get the openings, because they're so good at, like, uh, playing with rotations and uh, taking space. But if there's no space because you give away the first uh, frag, like, on Vertigo, for example, Nefany is going for that opening yes. on A every single round. And I watched a lot of demos of them because obviously they were the best Vertigo team yeah. in a long period of time, right? But they had something where they just, like, if he died early, they just went B, four guys. And they just went instantly, every single time. And I was just like, how, how do you, 
you can't keep getting away with this. Somehow, yeah. Right? Yeah. There. The, again. Again. At Cologne, by the way, they had the lowest flash assist of any team in the entire tournament. So, like, it, it just keeps happening. Like, I feel like the style is just so. It's so predicated on these individuals finding openings with purely great mechanics, and it's like. That's why we can see the peak at Dallas because they actually have so like world class players. But then we also can see them fall so hard against like Imperial at the major, and then what we see here at Cologne, it's like, dude, they're they're like, I, I don't man, they're like they just are the definition of like in terms of the style. The style is so online to me. It's still so online. Like I I can't get behind this, this style because it's so inconsistent in terms of setting people up. It's just like. Uh, actually, for people that want to know more about their style, though, like the Cloud9... What's his, what's his name? C9 Win is what C9 his Win. Is. Yeah, C9 yeah. Win made a great video of breaking down what their style is all about. And I, I don't necessarily agree with the way that they play. I just think it's... I just don't think it's right. So, man, I mean, check out his video. That's a, that's the plug for me on this one. To tie into that, by the way, essentially what this guy pointed out, Hooksy, was like, if you look at how Cloud9's T-side is set up, they basically mm -hmm. just use their utility to get into position and then they just sort of passively wait for the CTs yeah. to push for information or, like, double peak a spot or something, right? The, yeah. the reason I actually thought was a very shrewd point to make, Murray, is like... You can see it's a style. It's clearly a conscious decision. But here's the flaw, in my opinion, they've made. You can't do that all the time. Like, if you do that all the time, eventually the other teams figure that out as well, and they punish you for that. Like, all of a sudden now, they know, for example, save more utility. They're going to use all theirs earlier on. Don't peak early. Like, fucking make them... Like, let them kill us a few times where we just don't know where they're coming from, just so we never give them the early kill. Like, see how they play a 5v5. Because the problem with that style, in my opinion, is... Even if you perfectly execute, you've got to keep them honest. You've got to, like, throw in a few rushes randomly or just have a round where a guy just lurks on the other side of the map and does whatever he wants. Like, if you don't do that, eventually teams are just not going to peak. You're going to be in a fucking bad spot. The funniest yeah. thing about C9 Win's video is that he also showed, like, sometimes they try to switch it up, but then they yes. don't even throw the nades that other teams throw on yes. these fast plays. They they miss <laughs> barrel mollies, or they just, like, don't yeah. throw good entry flashes. It's just, like... Yeah, well, well, like obviously, yeah. that's not good enough, but, like... I feel like their biggest problem is just that nobody else does this besides Nefany. Like, nobody goes for an aggressive play or an aggressive opening. Like, imagine if Exile just one, like just once on Vertigo got two flashes and just ran up the beast ass and killed two people. Like, people would be so much more scared and aware yes. and use way more utility against them. And yeah, yeah, th there's just a bunch of, of things where I just feel like, I don't know, if I were playing against them again on Vertigo, I would just send three guys to towards A with three silencers and I would just spam every single smoke I saw until something happened in the round because nothing will happen before Nefity does something. At least that's how I feel. Maybe they mm -hmm. do something differently or that's just the way, not the way it is. But like looking from the outside and in, I feel like, yeah, I, I just feel like it's all up to Nefity. By the way, just as an aside before we end, Barry Stick, did you actually somehow get so lucky that you did the episode where you flamed Nafani? And then I think that actually might have been the last episode. So there wasn't an episode since when he won the event. So no one like flamed you back. But then now you now he's bombed again. And that's when the next episode was. So now it's like you just get to continue like a sustained just barrage. Like and I, and I was right the whole time. Like, I, know, I, I, know. Think, I think it was actually the last episode. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm on that. I think it was, wasn't it? I think pretty you sure. have one in between because you had that event or whatever. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Oh, well, unlucky for Nafani. You should have had a week there where you at least got a reprieve. But Yeah, I know. No, I know. I, I, praise, I praised that. him at the event. I didn't praise him on a podcast. Yeah, that's I also did appreciate, by the way, where you did that thing. I would do it as well, don't give a fuck about it. Where you used your chance to do the official event interview just to drill into all the shit you oh, yeah. care about. Like, basically, just I, like, am I right or wrong? Like, just be like they, why they, not? Do it. Go for it. Yeah, they definitely, they, <laughs> they were like, hey, who wants to do the interview? And who do you want to do it with for the team? I was like, let me do Nafani right now. Like, I just, <laughs> yeah. There you go. So I got yeah. this. I got, yeah.